Hi everyone, Carl Steele, English 4113 first class in Orinoco, which I believe is class 10 for the semester. We're going to come back to this sculpture in just a bit, but you will see that it's pretty easily to connect this in some way with Alfred Ben's novel. So here we go. Um, here are the title pages of the first publication of Ben's novel. I'm going to pronounce her name that way. Um, you might pronounce it a different way. It's published as part of a volume that contains three histories, namely Vitalicit, that's an abbreviation for a Latin, Vitalicit, which means namely, Orinoco, or the Royal Slave, the Feral Jilt, or Tarquin and Miranda, Agnes de Castro, or the Force of Generous Love by Mrs. A. Ben, published in London, 1688. And then we turn the page, and then we get the title page of this particular novel, which is part of this larger set of material. So she is born uh, 1640, dies 1689. Birth name is uncertain, perhaps Cooper. She gets the surname Ben from a man named Johann Ben, uh, who's maybe Dutch, who's maybe German. She's married to him, 1664, and maybe not living with him after that, she is a dramatist, so she writes plays, and she eventually writes novels. She's the first woman we know of to make a living exclusively as a writer, uh, at least in England. So she's historically important in that regard. Uh, in writing novels, that's also not so unusual. A novel as a genre is really beginning to emerge at this time. So there's a tendency among many people to call any long prose work a novel, at least if it's not a how-to book. Um, but a novel is a specific kind of thing. It is fictional, and it is, it's a long story that is not a lie, uh, but it's also not true. It occupies some kind of strange middle ground between truth and lying. Uh, and that realm is make-believe, and it's a make-believe that's based on the real world. And so in with, with regard to that, uh, for Ben to frame this work as a history is not so unusual. She's going to claim this work is actually true, and it's actually something she witnessed. She herself was probably in Suriname uh, about 20 years prior to writing this book, so she certainly is familiar, if she was there, with South America, at least a small corner of it that the English briefly colonized. But what she's talking about is really otherwise made up. It's a tissue of material drawn from many other genres. So she calls it a history, um, but it's not actually real life. Uh, the real life is, is our reaction to it and the effects that this book has on the world. So it's a novel. Uh, the genres uh, help us understand what it is this book is supposed to be doing. Um, so one of the features of the early novel in English is that that genre is being invented. And so it sometimes does things that we don't really expect a novel to do. Um, and in fact, sometimes does things that novels aren't really going to do again until the 20th or 21st centuries when experimental fiction becomes much more prevalent. So for example, Henry Fielding in his book, Tom Jones, when he skips over his hero's childhood, uh, has to include a chapter that says, I'm not going to talk about his childhood because I don't have to talk about everything. So he's training readers how to understand this new genre called the novel. So Ben is going to mix a bunch of different things together. And if she was writing this book 100 years later, it probably would look something more like what we'd expect a novel to look like. So she has a bunch of natural history and ethnography, especially about Native Americans that happens very early in the book. And I don't think a modern novelist would probably do that. Certainly no 19th century novelist would start to tell us a story about the slave prince and then spend five or six pages talking about Native Americans and then finally return to our prince, the hero Orinoco. But this is part of what she's doing is she's providing a picture of an English colony or a former English colony. Um, it is also obviously for the first half of it, a romance or heroic tragedy. It would work very well as an opera, I think. And she has that in mind as a dramatist. You can imagine this material being put on stage. And indeed it was in the period after Alfred Ben's death. It's adapted for the stage several times. And we're gonna be reading one of those adaptations. So the characters, just to remind you, are our hero, Oranoko. Uh, we have his love, Imoenda. We have 
what this aged woman who's going to help uh, help arrange for Orinoco and Imunda to get together. Her name is Onahal. And then we have Adelan, who's Onahal's tricky friend, who also works together with Onahal to try to bring about their romance. And then we have Orinoco's grandfather, the king, who is so enraptured by Imunda's beauty that he marries her. And that's where the tragedy happens, of course, is because he marries the woman Orinoco loves. And then as a result of that, Orinoco and Imunda are sold into slavery. Um, and they're also sold into slavery for another reason, which is simply the existence of the transatlantic slave trade. So this novel is keenly aware that Africans enslave each other. And that has been fact, been, had been going on for, well, one has to presume for centuries at least, but what changes that is of course, shipping people across an ocean in such a way that they cannot get back home. So that new thing is transatlantic slavery. And that's where, Ben introduces a new genre into this novel, one that I don't think has a name yet. So here is a, a small chart of, that gives you a sense of the enslavement of Africans by European, uh, European traders in, in humans. Um, we can see each one of these numbers are in thousands. So from 1451 to 1500, uh, enslaved Africans are going to Europe primarily. They're going there 25,000 people in the second half of the 15th century. So we saw in Azuera in 1444 in Lagos, Portugal, um, an arrival of somewhat south of 300 people. Uh, so now imagine that 25 times over um, and well, 75 times over really to get to 25,000. Uh, also to the Atlantic Islands or the Canary Islands. 9,000. You can see that Europe becomes, by 1650, a place that Africans are not being brought to as enslaved people in any number that's worth recording. Maybe a small handful of them, but it is really not a primary place where enslaved Africans are ending up. So that also helps you understand the story of Mémé Leblanc, the story of the, of the so-called Langue en Sauvage, the uh, wild girl that we read from the mid-18th century, because by that point, for a black girl or supposedly black girl to show up in France, no one would know what that means because we're really a long way since enslaved black people are showing up in Europe. There are, of course, black people living in Europe, but they're probably not living there as slaves at this point, uh, and certainly not as slaves who have been brought there freshly from Africa. Um, eventually, uh, Spanish America becomes a key site for uh, enslaved Africans to be shipped to. Brazil is the place and this is 4 million, right? That's what that number means by the end of 1865. Um, and the British Isles, uh, British islands rather, places like, places like Barbados and Jamaica, um, this, is, this is the number. So Britain is, 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 not, is in the third, third place overall. And then France, especially Haiti, um, are, is, is here in terms of absolute numbers. Again, that's 1,866, so, sorry, 1,000, so six, you can do the math. I can't do it for right now for whatever reason. North America is, is not the primary place people are being shipped. Um, and then this might here, 44, 44,000 that is, might indicate Suriname. So this is where uh, Orinoco and Imoenda are shipped. And it's a slight spoiler alert on Imoenda if you haven't finished the novel yet, but he, she's also been sent there. So um, Suriname, um, slavery, the enslavement of Africans by the British is really, again, really beginning to take off in precisely the period that Afra Ben is writing her novel. Basically, the 17th century is when the British involvement in the trade and African people is really starting to become huge. And then this pro here probably represents Suriname. So she's writing at a really key historical juncture that point when um, the enslavement of Africans is becoming central to, to the English economy and with it, the legal creation of two categories which exist hierarchically, hier hierarchically, white people and black people. These are legal categories first and not really categories about what people look like. So here's what Offer Ben says about slavery. Um, first off here, I'm using the 1688 edition why don't the English enslave the natives? Well, she says, being on all occasions very useful to us, we find it absolutely necessary to caress them as friends, 
and not to treat them as slaves. Nor dare we do that, their numbers being so far surpassing ours on that continent. Why don't the English enslave Native Americans? Because otherwise the English would be killed, right? There's, there's no politically expedient reason to do it. Why do they enslave what she calls Negroes? Those then whom we make make use of to work on our plantations of sugar are Negroes, black slaves altogether, which are transported thither in this manner. And then she says, this is how we do it. Why do they do it? She doesn't, she doesn't say, she doesn't explain that. And that's itself fascinating. So there are two things I really wanna call your attention to here. One is that she, the first thing to call them is black people, right? Negroes, that's the term she uses, which she gets from the Spanish. Um, and so there's no reference to them being pagan, right? Uh, Azarara, when we saw this Portuguese writer from the mid 15th century, is very keenly insistent that the reason that black people are being enslaved by the Portuguese is because they're gonna be converted to Christianity. He understands it as a Christian mission. By the time Ben is writing 1688, that is just not an issue that's gonna be at the foreground. It's all about money and about convenience. Why do the English enslave black people? Because they can get away with it. Because if they enslave native people, they can't make a profit because they would be in too much danger from the people they enslaved and from their friends. And of course, Native Americans can simply escape back to where, back to the land they already know. They, whereas if you're a black person who's been enslaved, you can't get across the Atlantic, really not without basically hijacking an entire boat which people did try to do, at least on one occasion. So that is itself interesting, just in terms of the history of slavery and of racialization. Um, second thing I want to call attention to is the way that um, the way that she talks about Orinoco. So here again is a 17 is a statue from about 1700. This is an English statue, obviously, obviously of a black man wearing a collar, very fancily dressed, very beautiful man, beautiful marble, beautifully dressed. You're not going to find a statue of a black man, I don't think, produced in England a hundred years later that looks like this. By 1800, you're going to have scientific racism. Uh, you're going to have a real attempt to justify slavery by saying that black people are fundamentally an inferior form of human than white people. They're going to, you're going to find attempts, as we've already seen in Jefferson, to say that black people can endure more pain, they require less sleep, they smell bad, that they're fundamentally stupid and unable to write well. That stuff has not yet been invented yet. Right? Those justifications don't exist yet. And for that reason, Ben is able to talk about Orinoco in a way that I don't think she would have been able to talk about him had she been writing this novel 100 years later. Again, race is a human construct, therefore it has a history. Therefore, we can track its development. The idea that Black people are fundamentally stupid compared to white people is not yet an idea that's been fully fleshed out. That sort, those forms of justification of slavery don't yet exist. And they don't quite need to exist yet because slavery is not yet at the absolute center of the English economy. So the key thing I want to call attention to, which you certainly notice, is the way that she Europeanizes Orinoco. So she says, she says he's got a flat nose. She says she's, he's got long, straight hair. Um, that is itself, right? She's, she has a Roman nose, she says. This is, these are all ways to say he looks beautiful and proper like a European aristocrat, right? But it's not that she exactly makes him white, not exactly. She says his face was not of that brown, rusty black, which most of that nation are, but a perfect ebony or polished jet. These are pitch black, perfectly black substances. And she is in fact darkening his skin beyond what most human skin is. Uh, she's making him blacker, in fact, than anybody else. But she's comparing him to ebony and to jet. These are material objects. They are luxury import materials. Jet is a kind of wood. No, ebony is a kind of wood. Jet is a kind of stone or, or a min mineral, which have to be imported. Um, and so they're imports. 
One of them is from India. I need to look this up, which, which one it is. But basically, it's talking about international trade and this human being is being compared to a particular beautiful kind of material that's a wonderful shade of black. So that gives us a sense of how it is that she's talking about Orinoco. I think the closest analog may be something like the way that Helen Moore is being talked about at the Scottish port in 1505, 1506. So Dunbar, as you recall, writes a terrifically racist poem about her, but you can still remember she's being upheld as a prize at an aristocratic tournament. Why? Because to a black, to a white audience at this point, a black person is exotic. They're a luxury good. They're not simply something to be loaded on with labor. So does that, is that any better for being, being enslaved? Probably not that great, but it's still interesting in terms of the history of racialization. So I also want to call attention to something you're going to encounter later on in the book. So we, we have been writing, I forgot to tell you that those who are nobly born of that country, so this is where or Orinoco and Imelinda are from, are so delicately cut and raced all over the forepart of the trunk of their bodies that it looks as if it were Japan, the works being raised like high point around the edges of the flowers. Blah, 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 blah. So this is talking about uh, scarification, uh, ritual, presumably, or noble scarification. She's saying Imelinda and Orinoco are scarified. So they have, they have these patterns on their bodies that have been applied through, through opening wounds in them. Uh, what is it like? It's like a fancy cabinet imported from Japan. There was a real uh, mania for them in England in the late 17th century. They were uh, very fashionable, very expensive luxury good. Again, imports, imports from India, from Japan. This is what they're being compared to. Again, hugely important to recognize for understanding the way that race is functioning in this novel, at least for aristocrats, right? And Imelinda and Orinoco are both aristocratic, which is hugely important for understanding this book. Why? Um, well, actually, let me let me just point out, you might want to pause this, uh, the show at this point and just read over this passage here from Lisa Lowe's The Intimacy of Four Continents, which is part of where I'm getting this material about Japaning and polished jet and so on. So it's the way that Lowe is talking about the kind of strangely Asian import qualities of these two characters in Ben's novel. Really, really fascinating. Okay. Um, now, aristocrats. Um, the, the kind of political trauma that Alfred Ben is writing about is something that happened to uh, King Charles of England in the mid part of the 17th century, about 20 or so years prior to her writing this book. And that is the beheading of the King Charles I of England. So here is an image from 1702, a very famous image. Uh, so about 60 years after Charles is killed, of him being beheaded. There he is. He's praying. He's blindfolded. They put a crown on him just so we know who that is. And he's lost. Uh, basically, there's a rebellion, and he's lost. And here he is being executed. We have the uh, very <coughs> unusual image of an executioner wearing a hood or a face mask. This is designed to protect the identity of the, uh, of the, ex of the executioner. But uh, as Alison Kinney observes in her book, Hood, um, there is no precedent prior to that for executioners wearing hoods. That's just, it's a, real, it's a new thing. It has everything to do with, with basically political power. Anyway, Alfred Ben is, is a royalist. She's on the side of the king and the memory of the king. And she really feels this, an outrage. And she has Orinoco also feel that way himself. He had heard of the late civil wars in England and the deplorable death of our great monarch and would discourse of it with all the sense of the abhorrence of the injustice imaginable. So how do we know that the killing of Charles I is bad? Because Orinoco tells us it is. He himself, who's not even English, feels that it's terrible. What is Alfred Ben's politics? Well, it's a very complicated relationship to royalty and to Europe. Because of course, Orinoco's father is a king, but Orinoco's father is in many ways a tyrant. And he's a tyrant who is subjecting to Melinda the various forms of sexualized violence. Um, so that's important to recognize. Offer Ben's portrayal of sovereignty and of kingship is never a simple thing, but she is a royalist. And that's what makes this novel much more a royalist novel than an abolitionist novel. The tragedy is that Orinoco is a prince 
who's enslaved. It's not that he's enslaved, it's that he's a prince who's enslaved. Okay. Um, a few more points um, about her relationship to Europe or Orinoco's relationship to Europe. We have here uh, Orinoco's culture comes from his conversations with a Frenchman of wit and learning. So it's a Frenchman and he's very happy to talk to the English. So he learns, he learns French and he learns English, but he also acquires European culture from these people. And obviously Ben thinks of this as an improvement, right? We can think again of these stories of whitening, these people, these writers who think, oh no, we can actually improve black people. They're not fundamentally bad. And how do you improve them? Well, you just make them whiter. Right, that seems to be what a lot of these people are saying. And Ben is no different. But we also have this really weird sentence. And I think maybe we can talk about this in class where she writes, when Orinoco has been uh, tricked and kidnapped and enslaved by this English captain, who is his friend, and they say, some have commended this act as brave in the captain, but I will spare my sense of it and leave it to my reader to judge as he pleases. Well, we can talk about what that means, but basically she's saying some people might think what the English did here was very clever, but maybe we should doubt that, right? Um, so that's something to be aware of as well. Uh, what uh, Alfred Ben has complicated relationships to kingship and perhaps complicated relationships to Europe. Remember that the Europeans are liars and the natives, both Native Americans and also the Africans that she talks about, are people of honor who never lie. And perhaps they never lie because they're too simple, at least in Ben's opinion, to be able to lie. In fact, that honor that they have is perhaps in Ben's reading, a simply a kind of symptom of their undevelopment, okay? So we can talk about what that means in class. Um, finally, I think the relationship of this novel to slavery is enormously complicated, and we'll talk about that a little bit today and also on Tuesday. But I want to point your attention to this really important paragraph. So um, the captain has tricked Orinoco into ending his hunger strike by promising to turn the ship around and to land him and to return him to freedom. Of course, he doesn't do that. He brings him to South America. And so Orinoco, believing the English captain is a man of honor because Orinoco believes everyone is a man of honor. Um, and he just is sad that he's separated from Imelinda because he believes that she's dead, he's been lied to. Uh, after this, they no longer refused to eat but took what was brought them and were pleased with their captivity since by it, they hoped to redeem the prince who all the rest of the voyage was treated with all the respect due to his birth, right? Ben's a royalist, remember that? Though nothing could divert his melancholy and he would often sigh for Melinda and think this a punishment due to his misfortune and having left that noble maid behind him that fatal night in the Otan when he fled to the camp. Who is he blaming for his enslavement? He's not blaming the entire slave system, which is indeed a system that he's participating in to this point. In fact, the first gift he makes to him in Melinda are enslaved people. He blames himself. He personalizes this. It's not a systemic critique. It's a particular critique that has to do with his emotions and perhaps with the genre of a tragic, of a heroic tragedy. So this is something, again, we can pick up in class. Uh, what is Ben's what has been doing here when she has Orinoco personalize his relationship to slavery? Okay, thank you.